So we are going to start with an introduction to the uh, uh, field of electronic systems uh, that will allow me to stress some issues that we are going to, let's say, uh, discuss in more detail during the, 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 the subsequent uh, lectures of the course. So uh, the, the main point is, the, is that the engine of ICT, of inf information and communication technology, is really semiconductor technology. It's a pretty recent technology. Uh, it's just uh, less than 70 years old, uh, but it has been impressive in terms of uh, improvement pace. Uh, all started in 1947 when the first transistor was uh, built. It was the point contact transistor at uh, the, the Bell Labs at the time, so it's almost 70 years ago. And before that time, you have to um, consider that uh, uh, electronics was already there but uh, all electronic systems were based on uh, valves, on, on, on tubes, okay? So uh, uh, every, every electronic equipment was pretty bulky, large, very hot, consumed a lot of power, okay? We had uh, in 47 already radios, TVs, uh, uh, radars, uh, and so on, but they were all built with uh, electronic tubes. Uh, after the invention of the transistor, uh, the pace uh, uh, accelerated pretty quickly. And uh, uh, in uh, 1971, 61, sorry, uh, which is an important year for semiconductor technology, the first integrated circuit was built. It was built in, in uh, in, in parallel by uh, uh, Bob Noyce and Jack Kirby. It's not important, the, the, the names, but uh, it, it was a very simple circuit. It consisted <coughs> only of uh, six transistors printed on the same silicon die. It's a sil th this uh, a green uh, disk that you can see is a, uh, is a silicon um, slice and with a technology very similar to print technology it was possible to have on the same substrate on the same silicon substrate both the transistors the interconnections and uh, and uh, all the other passive components resistors and capacitors uh, that technology was really instrumental because from that point uh, onward it was possible to increase uh, the number of transistors on a single chip with uh, uh, an exponential pace and I really mean exponential you know uh, the, 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 this um, a function the function of the increase of the number of chip as a function of the year is an exponential function, the number of chip doubles every 18 months or every two years, and it has become known as the Morse law. If you make the calculations, it is pretty easy to see that in 50 years, from 61 to 2010, you go from six transistors on a chip to one billion transistors on a chip. Okay? This, this uh, example of 2007 is the Intel Core i7 uh, microprocessors, which has more than 1 billion transistors in a 32 nanometer technology. Okay, 32 nanometer more or less is the gate length of uh, the MOSFET, of the, the, the minimum gate length of the MOSFET on board. Okay. Uh, of course, you already know how it was possible. The main, uh, uh, the main improvement here was in the 
decrease in size of the transistors. The size of the chip did not increase that much. This was a few millimeters in diameter. The, the core i7 is, uh, uh, let's say, something like two times one centimeter in, uh, as an order of magnitude, no more than that. What really increased a lot uh, was uh, the, the scaling down of uh, transistors. The, the in, in the first IC, the size of a transistor was uh, 100 micron, uh, uh, more or less. And uh, from 100 micron, the, 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 the industry, the semiconductor industry, went to 32 nanometers. OK, so it's a reduction in, in, in linear size of uh, uh, four orders of magnitude and of course in terms of area it's a reduction of eight orders of magnitude and this is how you go from order 10 to order 1 billion okay now uh, um, just just to have an idea uh, this means that transistors are, are extremely small are smaller than a virus. This is an IK metal gate transistor from 2007 on the left uh, for RF frequency application. The gate length is 35 nanometers. The influenza virus is 100 nanometer in diameter. Okay, so the, the devices are really extremely small. Uh, now we need to uh, understand how do we connect the size of transistors and the number of transistors on a single chip with the, uh, the system's capability of course so uh, what we can do with uh, all these transistors Th the main issue to consider is that a a as you know a transistor is a, a logic switch so the, the number of transistors is directly proportional to the computational power that you have on board. Uh, I mean, of course, you can do a lot with better architectures. You can do a lot with, uh, with better circuits. But in the end, uh, you have, uh, eight, uh, as I've shown you, eight orders, uh, orders of magnitude of increase of the numbers of transistors. And that is the main factor that allows you to have uh, a much uh, larger computational capability. Just to make, uh, um, let's say, a stupid example, if you want, Atari Pong was from 1976. It was uh, w one of the first video game. It was basically the first commercial product that brought video games from, uh, uh, from, from specific places to the home because you need to connect it to the TV in order to, to, to play. I had it uh, as, a, as a Christmas present when I was 10. Not in se I, I mean, I'm from 68, but when I was 10 and in 78, I got it, OK? And uh, uh, I, I mean, you, I, probably you know Pong. If you go to a vintage uh, video game website, you can see it. Basically, it's like uh, it's a sort of uh, tennis, OK? And you have two joysticks in order to play. And then you have, uh, in 2013, uh, FIFA 14. Now, now FIFA 17 is going to come out in a few, in a few days. And, uh, and of course, the type of, you can imagine the computational capabilities that you need to have that type of uh, video game is completely different. And the main difference here is the number of transistors. Because Pong had, uh, a, as an, a main chip, an Atari 3659 IC. Uh, at that time, Atari did their own chip. They did not have a fab, but they make the, 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 the complete design of the integrated circuit. The integrated circuit was dedicated to the video game. It was an integrated circuit to play Pong. I mean, not a general purpose processor, okay? Just specific to play Pong. And had 3,000 transistors on board. If you want to use uh, FIFA 14 and later, you need to play them on an Xbox One or on a PlayStation, on a Sony PSP4. And they both have uh, a 5 billion transistor core. 
Like they basically have uh, two four core microprocessor, so eight Jaguar cores. Jaguar is, uh, is uh, an AMD core, uh, low cost, but specifically for video games. Okay, in total you have five billion transistors. And that is the main thing. You have one million times more transistors, more or less you have one million times better, uh, more computational capabilities, and then you go from Pong to, to FIFA 2007. Okay, this is a video game, but the same type of improvement in scale is possible for any type of application from the 60s, the 70s to now, to these years. Okay, uh, I, I don't want to downplay the importance of better architectures uh, uh, and so uh, and better techniques uh, to to develop stuff, but. The, the main importance of these architectures on the uh, software development techniques is the capability to manage this uh, large amount of computational capabilities that you have available. Of course, you cannot uh, uh, design by hand and program by hand, uh, 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 let's say uh, a, a video game such as FIFA 2000, 2007 as you did with Pong but the so you need better architectures and better software development uh, tools in order to be able to manage the complexity but uh, the power of uh, using the, 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 the computational power comes in, in, in the most part from the technology Okay, uh, so just to, to, to set the context a little bit, uh, this is just an introduction to, to, to the whole thing. Let me uh, stress a few aspects because uh, a few aspects related to, to, the, to history, to what happened between 14, uh, 1947 and, uh, uh, and, and now. Actually, 1947, in the summer of 1947, the transistor was invented. The patent was from 1948. So this is why I wrote here 1948. But the, the, the invention was in the summer of 1947. And, uh, and um, basically, there were three guys. Uh, Bardin. <coughs> Bardin is the, the one here on the left. I don't know if I, no, I cannot pull. OK. Then we have uh, um, Bratin is this one, and Shockley is this one. Uh, uh, the, the, the story is, uh, this is just a remake of the initial prototype of the transistor. The story is nice because basically uh, uh, Shockley, the, the man in the middle, was the boss. And they were trying to make, uh, um, they were trying to make something that is more similar to the MOSFET instead of the bipolar transistor. But then they, uh, the problem is that they couldn't uh, have it working because uh, in the end, the, the, the charge at the interface between silicon and silicon oxide was too large and they weren't able to switch the device on, on and off. And uh, what happened in the end is that when Shockley was uh, on vacation in the summer. The, the other two find another way to have uh, this transistor behavior, and they invented the point contact transistors. And they filed for, fi filed, uh, for the um, application. Of course, Shockley was mad at them because they basically made the invention and filed for the, the patent when he was on on vacation but he had some some uh, uh, some uh, other ideas uh, and uh, he was a, actually was a great scientist in, in a strange type but a great scientist and then he basically uh, patent other two possible applications of the same principle in parallel so that the in the end the transistor invention consisted of three different patents one with uh, with Bardeen and Bratley, and one and two with Shockley. Okay, 
And then in uh, a few years later, they got the Nobel Prize for the invention of the transistor. I mean, it was really a great invention from the point of view of the physics of the, 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 <coughs> of the device. Uh, uh, let's say a nice story. But as I mentioned before, there was already an electronic industry in place. And that industry was based on uh, electronic tubes. Okay, and then uh, uh, the point was that the tubes were better than the transistor because they had better performance. There was already an established industry. There was already a market there. And uh, uh, the transistor technology was really at the beginning uh, with huge reliability problems. So in the end uh, uh, AT&T which was the owner of the labs and therefore the owner of the patent uh, did not know what to do with this invention okay they, it took a while they they, they the, the I mean the main uh, apparent advantage was that uh, transistors were small and could work with less power but of course I mean, you typically had transistor, uh, you had computers in large rooms, you had electronic appliances in large rooms, you had a connection with, uh, with the electronic mains, there was no electric mains, there was no reason to have something small, and that has a smaller power consumption. And therefore, the first applications were very, very simple. Uh, this one was from 1952. L look at the dates, because they're important. In 48, you have the transistor patent and in 52 already there's the first application first commercial application and it was a hearing aid he a hearing aid uh, of course in that case it's important that it's portable that you, uh, that you can use uh, small batteries and then uh, and then it, uh, um, it, it then the whole thing is small it's simple thing you have a microphone and uh, and um, a loudspeaker in the ear that's it uh, from a small company which is Sonoton and and that is, of course was a nice application but a niche application I mean very small market you cannot think of selling millions of them and then they uh, licensed the patent to a small company that wanted to do cheap transistor radio there was a small company in Japan that wanted to do uh, cheap transistor radio low quality uh, but at least portable something that uh, something that would allow you to let's say listen to the radio when you're on the go and not let's say at home okay and this company basically got the license and started to sell this one transistor radio there there was just one transistor and that transistor was used to amplify to not just to amplify to to let's say um yeah, to amplify the signal after, after it had been moved to uh, audio band. And uh, the, the company was Sony. It we, we, that was very small at the, at the beginning. And then from there, Sony could grow and have uh, actually a very large market. This is the beginning. Then we have the invention of the integrated circuit. The invention dates from 1958, even if the first commercial I see was was available in 61 there were two people in in uh, at the same time which got the invention independently uh, jack hilby and, and robert noise and uh, that is really a technology because the, the, there's no new physics in the invention of the integrated circuits it, ju it is just a way to have everything on a single piece of silicon a single silicon die as I, I, and um, yeah but of course it was this technological improvement that allowed the uh, possibility to increase the number of transistor per chip every year or every two years okay. uh, Jack Hilby uh, got the uh, got the Nobel Prize for the invention not physics Nobel Prize in physics in in 2000 okay for the invention of the integrated circuit. Uh, Robert Noyce did not get to 2000, actually. 
So, and then uh, we are talking now of uh, bipolar transistors. Uh, the the um, silicon MOSFET was demonstrated later. The principle of operation was already be uh, was already let's say invented thirty years before, but uh, there was no um, no actual. Uh, uh, possibility of having a, a, a working MOSFET because of that problem that I mentioned before the, the charge at the interface between silicon and silicon oxide and uh, a, a method for eliminating this charge at the interface was uh, uh, obtained in 1960 and from there from there on, it, the, 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 the rise of most transistor started. You probably know that now more than 95% of transistors in the market are MOSFETs. Okay, the bipolar transistors are, are really a niche market only used for high frequency applications, basically. Okay, for logic circuits, for digital circuits, you only have uh, MOSFET now. And uh, uh, also, uh, <coughs> let me see if I should add something here. No, le 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 let's keep it here. Excuse yeah. Uh, what is the difference between a MOSFET and a bipolar transistor? Uh, yeah. Uh, the so uh, um, the best thing that I can can uh, um, give you, I mean, I I it's not something that I can uh, tell you in, in just a few minutes. Uh, the best thing that I can give you is some pointers uh, to where to read. Uh, the, the, but you should, uh, should yeah, you, shou you, you should read and understand clearly the difference. It, 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 it's a complete lecture or a few, a few lectures. It's not something I can deliver to you now. Uh, so I mentioned Moore's law uh, before. Let me uh, tell you uh, uh, something more about Moore's law. Uh, the, 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 the story of Moore's law is uh, uh, pretty interesting. I, it was uh, in a in a talk that Gordon Moore, that was the uh, president of Intel in 1965, uh, gave at an important semiconductor conference, and then was also in a, in a paper based on that talk. And basically what he said is that uh, uh, he, he tried to extrapolate some data from his company uh, technology. Uh, this plot on the right, was uh, the uh, w w contains both the data and the extrapolation. You can see that on the uh, x-axis you have the year of production, and on the y-axis you have uh, the logarithm in base two of the number of transistors in a single chip. So it, w it, it basically the argument was the following. It says, okay, in 1959 we had one transistor. We did not have a technology to, to build more transistors on a single chip. Okay. Then in, 60, in 62, we were able to have uh, eight transistors on a chip, two to the third power. In 63, two to the fourth. In 64, two to the fifth. In 65, uh, two to the sixth. Okay. So. Uh, doing some quite simple calculation, he said that at the end, I do not see any reason why we would not continue along these lines. And so he drew a straight line, which basically said every year we're going to double the number of transistors in a single chip. Part of that is due to the fact that you, the, mo the large part of it is due to the fact that you reduce the size of a transistor, and part of it is due to the fact that you can increase the size of the 
of the uh, of the chip from few millimeters to one centimeter in 50 years in the end it was not a an extremely large improvement uh, but the, the so it was not a law in 1965 it was just a prediction but the real point is that year after year uh, b b basically uh, one could put the dots along the line and then it became a law of course uh, l l let's say uh, a law in in a in a soft sense in sense it's not a law of physics okay it, it, it's just uh, uh, let's say a law of the industry also beca because it became a self-fulfilling prophecy because uh, every industry knew every, com every company in the industry knew that if it was able to double the number of transistors in a single chip in one year or a little bit more than that the company was going to be still in the market if they were not able to do that they would go out of the market and then I mean, every it became uh, not not only let's say something that you do exposed after things that have happened, but also it became a target every year. So in in this sense, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, uh, just to uh, consider what you can do with with uh, an increasing number of transistors and to, to have more context uh, from from the industry uh, it's nice to consider the first microprocessor okay the first microprocessor was introduced in 1970 by intel intel was at that time a small company and they did mostly uh, uh, RAM, SRAMs in particular. Okay, they, they were a memory company at that time, and they had a customer which wanted to make uh, a table calculator, an electronic calculator, and uh, basically ordered some chips to 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 make a calculator. So the chip had to be able to have an ALU an arithmetic logic unit to make the four calculations and to do that they decided to make a, a microprocessor so a general purpose thing that could be programmed to do uh, at the microcode level to do different calculations and here we have the 4004 it was the so it was done in in, in to, to let's say to fulfill a customer request and the uh, the the the, the, uh, the guy in charge of the project was uh, Federico Fagin, which is a no uh, is a name that you probably have already heard. He is this one, the one on the on the right, on the far right. Uh, it, let's, let's say it it, it is uh, Italian, still alive. Is is Italian? Is a physicist from from uh, uh, Rome, La Sapienza that went uh, to, to the US uh, to work in the, in the semiconductor business. He was a, a, a good technologist at the beginning and then he switched to design and he was the chief designer of the chip. So the 4004 had on board 2300 PMOS transistors. Okay, the logic was only based on PMOS uh, with a 10 micron process so pre 10 micron was the gate length the size of the transistor the clock frequency was a, a 100 kilohertz okay and the size uh, of the silicon die the die in, in in English just just to mention is is written D I E it is uh, uh, let's say it in Italian we would call it a tessera okay it, it's a small piece of silicon a piece of a slice of silicon on which you have uh, the uh, uh, silicon chip it was three by four millimeters okay so uh, uh, pretty simple it was basically designed by hand okay 
uh, it, it is possible to do that at that level it's it's not an easy project but three people in uh, in a few months can do that uh, this was the um, this is a micro uh, a micro photo of the 404 uh, you, you can see here I have an arrow here you, that there's the, the initial of uh, Federico Fagin here and th that's it you can almost see every single transistor you see the interconnections you, you're able to see everything and you can plot it on and, and put the plot on a table and you can have really follow all the connections and see if everything works because if you have to debug it you have to debug with a finger just by following it and see if everything is okay okay there's no 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 other <coughs> way to to do that okay and this was the uh the customer request uh, uh, the that chip was for this uh, buzigom 141 pf calculator you can see it's a simple calculator that is able to do the four operations okay that's it uh, uh, it was something that uh, uh, let's say could cost uh, the equivalent now of a of a the equivalent now of a notebook okay more or less that is the the the, the, the cost if you if you compare and to take into account the inflation it, it goes to that Busycom was a Japanese company in the US and also in Europe it was marketed with NCR uh, with the NCR brand that's it and uh, uh, ju just just to just to have an idea of what's inside if you look at the main board this is the main board and uh, okay so you, c you can okay. you can imagine it is something this size okay you, you open it and you can see here uh, you can see here the microprocessor here then you have also other chips on board you need uh, some of them you have uh, this uh, 4001 here you, you see there are a few of them at least four that is a ROM uh, the macro code of the microprocessor is written there is, uh, is a ROM which is mask programmable in the sense that the information in the ROM the macro code is written when you do the chip when you, when you basically when you print the interconnections on the chip okay it's not of course reprogrammable and at that time it was not uh, available uh, technology for reprogramming then you have some RAM 320 bit uh, 4002 you have two chips to for 320 bit okay this one and this and this one and then you have three 10 bit shift registers for making the operations okay and uh, okay more or less the, the chips are all the same size and then you have a lot of uh, single transistors this uh, 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 this black disks are single transistors okay. that typically are uh, let's say below every single key of the keyboard okay so it was not a single chip uh, uh, microcalculator even if uh, a microprocess a new microprocessor a completely new technology for the time you did not did not uh, uh, have just one microprocessor on board and Busycom, the same company, basically also had, uh, let me just show you, uh, more or less in the same year, also went out in the market with uh, a handy calculator. The handy calculator was this one, and uh, this was really a single chip calculator. Uh, if you look at the inside, the, you have two boards inside. This is one of the two boards, and this is uh, the a single chip that has all the functionalities of all the chips that we have seen and is able to do all the, uh, the work in, in addition to that you just have uh, let's say uh, electronics that is uh, needed to control the display and no more okay uh, in this case the chip was done by another company which was which was uh, Mostek at the time and that basically disappeared after a while so it, it is uh, uh, no one thing which is really interesting to see is that we had a small company 
that made uh, for the first time a microprocessor, the first Intel microprocessor. At the same time, another company which, were which was able to make everything in a single chip, the second company disappeared. I mean, and, and at that time, didn't have a worse technology than Intel. Okay, and in a few years, also Bizicom disappeared. Okay, and these are uh, names that do not exist anymore. We, we only Intel survived of, of the of the lot. Okay. <coughs> 